Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Today, I want to continue with my teaching on the book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. So I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, beginning with chapter 4, verse 1. In the KJV, it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. So, I'd like to see that in the Amplified. Now, what I mean when I talk about children and their guardians is this. As long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, even though he is the future owner and master of all the estate. But he is under the authority of guardians and household administrators or managers until the date set by his father when he is of legal age. So I guess to me what stands out is that there is a date set by the father. Um, I believe, um, oh, I can't remember where it is, but uh, Artaxerxes uh, made a decree. I think it's in Daniel or maybe Ezekiel. Uh, but uh, Artaxerxes made a decree that um, the the building of the um, the temple and and the wall around Jerusalem would begin. And from the date of the decree, it was prophesied that. So much time would pass and then the Messiah would come. And I've seen various calculations on, um, they just did the math and saw that it was so many days. And the exact day that Jesus arrived on the scene, uh, entering Jerusalem on the, on the, uh, the donkey, uh, that fulfilled that prophecy. So I think that's really what this is uh, alluding to. When it says, um, until the date set by the Father, or in the Amplified, uh, uh, until the time appointed of the Father. Um, so, did did God predetermine it? And, and uh, was that, is that determinism? I don't think so. I think God just sees all of history. Um, like... If you're watching a reel-to-reel -reel, um, movie, a reel-to-reel -reel is um, is made up of thousands, maybe tens of thousands of individual snapshots, and each snapshot is next to the next, the last one, and then then there's another one, <clears throat> and you, when you watch them in order, particularly at, 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 the, at the right speed, it looks like motion picture. <clears throat> so what we are doing is we're on this, uh, if we were to stretch out the, uh, the tape, and uh, we're someplace in this, uh, the snapshot of me right now, let's say is right here in the reel. Um, everything that happened before that point, in, in earlier in my life and long before my life, there are snapshots of all that. Uh, but uh, I can't go back in time. I can't go into the future. Uh, I just have to live in the now. But what God does is he has foreknowledge. He can see the entire reel at the same time. So he knows every picture, every little instant of time, everything that's going to happen from the very beginning, the first snapshot, the next one, the next one, all the way through the end of time. So God has this foreknowledge. And it's not because he has determined everything. Man does have a free will. So the idea of, of no free will and determinism that we get in Calvinism is an absolute evil lie from the devil. Because if God was determining everything, if God was controlling me like a puppet right now, making me do everything and say everything that I'm saying, um, and even... All the sins that I've done, God is controlling me and making me do these sins, then that would make God the guilty party and man the innocent bystander. We're just an innocent puppet. 
And so uh, Calvinism turns God into uh, a person, a being that's far more evil than the devil. In fact, the devil in, in Calvinism couldn't even be considered guilty. He, he, you can't hold the devil accountable because he's controlled like a puppet too. everything the devil does. God controls every single thing and therefore the devil or all of humanity, none of us should, could be held accountable because God made us, made us do it. Um, that, that's the evil of Calvinism. But as I see this, is that um, the time, it says that there is a, a, a time appointed of the Father. Um, that's the time that, uh, that God saw in the future how, how things would play out. Now, does God exercise his sovereignty and sometimes intervene and, and, and control a situation? Of course, God, the sovereignty of God does not mean that God controls every thought, word, deed of every person. Uh, no, the sovereignty of God means that God has the ability to control anything he wants to, anytime. But one of the things that God has done, thank you, Jesus, is he made his sovereign decision that you and I would have a free will. He would let us make decisions. Only in that way could we be held accountable. Uh, and, and so we have a free will, and but God knows in advance all the decisions we're going to make because he is omniscient and he has the timeline and he can see past, present, and future all at the same time. I know I went off on a tangent there, but that's what I'm thinking about when I see uh, until the time appointed of the Father. So the day that Jesus arrived on the scene, uh, riding on the, the foal of a donkey, uh, uh, that was uh, appointed, but it was it was not predetermined by God. It was it was the foreknowledge of God. That's why God could, uh, could uh, give us these prophecies in the Old Testament that give us a, a countdown, a certain number of days until the Messiah would arrive on the scene, and it would be perfectly accurate. And those prophecies is what get another reason that our faith was justified, because the prophecies prove that the, the, the Bible is inspired. It's the Word of God. Okay, so now let's go to the next verse. Uh, Verse 3, even so, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Uh, but when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So, in verse 4, it says, when the fullness of time was come. At the Appropriate time, uh, Jesus appeared on the scene uh, so that we could be saved from the curse of the law. Verse 4 in the Amplified, But when in God's plan the proper time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the regulations of the law, so that he might redeem and liberate those who were under the law, that we who believe might be adopted as sons, as God's children with all rights as fully grown members of a family. That was good. I, I, I liked how they expounded, they amplified uh, the verses there. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 6 in the KJV. Uh, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Okay, so, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. The spirit of the son of God is the Holy Spirit. Jesus' spirit is the Holy Spirit. And uh, into your hearts. Now, uh, as an evangelist, and, uh, and, and to all the evangelists, uh, the, those people who focus on soteriology, which is the study of salvation uh, and how to present it, and make it understandable. <clears throat> and um, um, there are certain things that kind of like make the hair on our neck raise up. Uh, phrases that, uh, that are commonly used uh, when people attempt to tell people about Jesus and salvation uh, that we think are, <clears throat> are unbiblical. It's not the right way to, to uh, 
to uh, present Jesus and salvation. Uh, the right way, of course, is that um, uh, God, eternal God Almighty, came down from heaven, became a man. The Bible says God was manifest in the flesh and uh, dwelt among us. This is Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, who is God, who is Savior, and who is man. And this person uh, lived a perfect, sinless life. No one's ever been able to do it. But this is God, man, and he did not have the sin nature that we have. So he lived a perfect, sinless life. He never did one thing wrong, and everything he did was good. Uh, and all that goodness, all that righteousness from his good works is credited to all of us who put our faith in him. So we receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to us, but also the sinfulness of us was charged against Jesus Christ as he suffered and died on the cross. So our sins went on Jesus, the righteousness of Christ goes on us who believe in him, who rely on him completely. And he raised himself from the dead bodily on the third day to prove that um, his claims were all true, that he does have power over life and death, and that he truly is God and Savior and that he does have the power of life and death, and he will raise us to life everlasting. So uh, this is, now this salvation, this eternal life is offered to everyone as a free gift. You don't have to join a religion. You don't have to become a religious person. Uh, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to say a prayer. You don't have to step forward in front of an, uh, a crowded church. You, there's nothing you need to do except believe that you're going to go to heaven solely because Jesus is your Savior. You believe you're going to go to heaven because Jesus paid for your sins. You're not accountable for your sins because he paid for them. Therefore, you are sinlessly perfect in the eyes of God and you are righteous because Jesus is righteous that was, uh, was credited to you. Uh, so uh, this is a free gift and you receive it at the moment you believe in Jesus and it's irrevocable. Um, it's irreversible by God or by man. Once we put our faith in Jesus, it can never be undone. It's permanent. We have uh, salvation guaranteed no matter what. Uh, uh, we cannot lose our salvation. So I would say this is the, this is a, a, a ideal way to present this good news. But then there are people who say you've got to invite Jesus into your heart. All right, you've got to uh, um, uh, pick up your cross and follow him. You've got to uh, repent of your, your sins. You've got to uh, give your life over to Christ. Give your life to Jesus. Uh, there, there's, there, you've got to say a sinner's prayer. There's a lot of things that, that people are say, you must do these things, and, but then we don't find it in the scriptures. And so uh, I always caution against that and, and say, let's use the biblical language. But here we find something that uh, should make us have a, a maybe a, a little different perspective on this idea of the heart. When it says, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. So the spirit of Jesus into our hearts. So. The Bible says that Jesus is in us and we are in Christ. Uh, when we put, put our faith in him, this is what happens. So to say that, um, to invite uh, Jesus into your heart, I can see how this verse here could support that. It says, God has set forth his spirit, the spirit of his son, into your hearts. Um, into your heart, it's not the organ, it's not the, the, the muscle that is pumping blood throughout your body. Your heart is your, um, I would say, have you ever heard the saying, it, his, his, his sentiment, his feeling, his conviction, it's, it's truly heartfelt. In other words, he really means it. He's really sincere. So uh, the, I would say that uh, in, uh, having the spirit of the Son of God into your heart means that into your being, into your innermost being, the core, the core beliefs that you have, that's, uh, it's absolutely sincere. And another example of this is when uh, um, 
Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch and uh, he explained to him Isaiah chapter 53 and the eunuch uh, got saved and the eunuch says, well, now that I believe, can I uh, be water baptized? And he says, yes, as long as you uh, believe with your whole heart. So there's another example where this idea of believing with your heart is expressed. And I believe believing your heart means that, yeah, if you truly believe, if, you, if you're really sincere, uh, then, then, uh, then, of course, get water baptized. Uh, uh, if you truly believe, of course, the Spirit of God is living inside you then because of your faith. Um, so uh, I'm not going to adopt the, the phrase and say in my witnessing to someone else, you, you need to invite Jesus into your heart. But on the other hand, there are some examples in the Bible when we see the word heart, where I can see where that uh, thinking could, could have come from. Um, so let me read that verse 6 in the Amplified. And because you really are his sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. I think that the Amplified is, is making the same point, maybe more concisely than I did. Sometimes I, I go on into too much detail, perhaps, but um, yeah, I, I think they very concisely said the same thing. It says, uh, and because you really are his sons, really, I mean, it means that because you've had this true conversion, this true repentance, which means change of mind, you have truly changed your mind. You no longer are going to striving to earn in your way to heaven by, by trying to uh, develop and, and acquire your own righteousness. No, you, you no longer uh, believe that. You've changed your mind and now you believe that you're going to go to heaven because Jesus is your Savior. You're relying completely on Jesus. And so uh, it says that Where is it again? Six. Oh, yeah. It's a, uh, and because you really are his sons. For, so for the people who truly uh, put their faith in, in Jesus, truly changed their mind, and now their, their mind is on the son rather than their own sins, their own ability to stop sinning and do good works. You know, but now their mind and their belief is on the son, not their sin. Uh, because you really are his sons, God has sent the Spirit. So God, if, if there is a true conversion, now I believe there, there certainly must be some people that mouth the right things. They, they know what to say. Um, I can't challenge a person's uh, verbal or written confession of faith. If a person says, um, uh, well, I, I, I am definitely going to go to heaven. Uh, and it's be because Jesus paid for my sins, and, and uh, uh, I'm relying completely on Jesus. And he promised I'm going to go to heaven, and I believe him. Well, if they say that, I have to take their word for it. Now, some people want to judge them by their lives, uh, see if they've changed their lives, uh, see if they're still continuing the same sinful things that they've done before, or if there's any kind of a noticeable change. And so that's the, that's a big mistake because because once we do put our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit uh, enters us, lives in us, and and we're sealed with the Spirit, and permanently the Spirit of God is in us. And while the Spirit is in us, the Spirit is uh, tempting to transform us, but the Spirit is not imposing um, God's sovereignty on us and controlling us. The the Spirit is is prompting us, uh, uh, teaching us through our conscience and uh, making our conscience perhaps more sensitive and fine-tuned. Uh, and now how do we respond to it? Uh, one brand new believer might uh, em totally embrace the promptings of the Holy Spirit and uh, uh, really be happy that the Holy Spirit is instructing them and in, in changing their, their desires and their thoughts and their actions. Uh, an, another person who is equally saved 
may be fighting against the Holy Spirit all the time because the old man, the flesh, with the sin nature, they're still, we're still living in that body. So there's a struggle going on between the old man and the, the new born again child of God. How, how people go through this struggle, how they uh, uh, maneuver through that is different we're, as individuals. We're not, uh, uh, some, some people will resist it so much that maybe over their lifetime you see little or no change in them. And then other people embrace this promptings of the Spirit and you see dramatic changes in them. Uh, but we should not judge a person's salvation based upon uh, how much or, or how little uh, change and improvement we see in their life and their conduct. Uh, we can only judge by their confession of faith. But some people may know what to say. And I believe I've met some people like this that they know exactly what to tell me. And yet I, I, I have my doubts. But I, I, we won't know. Uh, once we're all in eternity, We'll probably see some people there that we didn't expect and we'll probably be looking around for some people that no they never were they were really tares sitting right alongside the wheat in church um uh, okay so now verse 7 in the kjv let me see how many verse 31 verses in this chapter so i guess i'll try to get through about half of it um uh, verse 7 is, uh, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Uh, so oh, uh, there, were, were, there were no uh, sons of God or children of God until Jesus uh, died for our sins, rose uh, again, and uh, and then even ascended, and then the Holy Spirit came onto the church at Pentecost and indwelled and sealed the, whole, the, the believers. Um, until that time, there was no such thing as a child of God. Um, I discussed this in, uh, in, in an earlier video in this series. Uh, but what we now we're all uh, a child of God who put our faith in, in Jesus. And we're heirs of God through Christ, the scriptures say. Let me look at verse 7 in the Amplified. <clears throat> Therefore, you are no longer a slave or a bond servant, but, but a son. And if a son, then also an heir through the gracious act of God through Jesus Christ. What are we an heir to? Uh, I guess we're an heir to first the, the promise that God made Abraham. The uh, salvation would come through the, this, this, the promised one, the seed of Abraham. So that's we're first an heir to that, and then as child, as, as a child of God, just like if you are a child of a king, uh, then you're you're an heir to all, everything that the king has. So that's that's pretty exciting to know that in eternity that we have this standing you know, that's permanent that we are heirs. I'm, I, I really am so excited. I can't really wait to be in eternity. And uh, I did a, a series titled uh, uh, 50 Hours in Heaven. And don't confuse it, though, because of the title, with uh, some people's account that they say, well, they died and they went to heaven, or they died when they went to hell, and they're, and they're coming, they were brought back, and they tell you about that experience. So, no, this is not any claimed by me that I died and spent 50 hours in heaven. No, uh, it's called 50 hours in heaven because the, the, the playlist is actually 50 hours long. Say each video was an hour or two. So there's probably around, uh, you know, 20 or um, 25 videos, uh, an hour or two long, totaling 50 hours of teaching on heaven. And so I believe that the study of heaven is probably the most neglected, and I say sadly, the most neglected theological topic for Christians. Uh, a lot of Christians spend a lot of time thinking about hell and arguing about what that means, what is hell, and uh, how much time have you spent in your life really studying and discussing what 
is heaven like and what is, will eternity be like? And if you were to talk about that, when would you exhaust the subject? Probably almost everybody, they wouldn't know what to say after like two or three minutes. There's nothing else to say about it they, because they've never taken the time to study it. So uh, I urge everybody to watch that. Invest the time, watch 50 hours in heaven, and you will be very excited about your futures, future as an heir. Uh, now verse eight says, how be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Let's look at that in the Amplified. But at that time, when you did not know the true God and were unacquainted with him, you Gentiles were slaves to those pagan things which by their very nature were not and could not be gods at all. So, of course, we remember that uh, this book of Galatians is really written to a, a Gentile audience, uh, a congregation of Gentile believers, but maybe not believers because he's writing this letter to say, you're not believing the right thing anymore. Uh, did they ever believe the right thing? Um, if they believed correctly and got saved, and then they get led astray by the Judaizers, just like many people today, that they get saved through the simplicity of the cross and they're relying completely on Jesus and they're full of joy, this promise of eternal life. And then the, then the, the Calvinists or the Lordship Salvationists get a hold of them and start teaching all these uh, heresies. And now they, they are apostate. Uh, and yet, uh, even though they're heretics, they're saved heretics uh, because they can't lose their salvation. So, um, Perhaps some, maybe many of these Galatian uh, believers here uh, were saved and got led astray by the Judaizers. Maybe some of them didn't never believe correctly from the beginning and are, are, or never did get saved. Uh, but Paul is telling them, I taught you the true gospel and now you're believing a false gospel. And that's the whole point of this, this book. Uh, but he's saying, you Gentiles, uh, uh, you know, you were believing all these false gods before, but now you know about the one true God. Verse 9 says, um, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? So, it says, but now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. I, I've had people uh, make comments to me and and uh, make the, make this point that no, it's uh, it's not a question if you, do you know God. The question is, does God know you? And of course, I think that would be um, biblically correct based upon Jesus' denunciation of the lordship heretics. It says, depart from me. I never knew you. That's the last thing you ever want to hear from Jesus. I never knew you. <laughs> that means you never really had this uh, saving faith in him. Your faith was always somehow perverted uh, and not, not true, pure, uh, free gift theology. Uh, so uh, the important thing is for God to know you. Uh, and he knows you. Once you put your faith in Jesus, then God will recognize you as his child as an heir, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again? How in the world has this happened? I'm, uh, uh, you foolish Galatians, uh, who hath bewitched you? Uh, it's, it's, I'm shocked and amazed. I just can't believe it. That's the point he's continuing to make here. He says, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? Whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. All religion is is a form of bondage. It doesn't matter if it's uh, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, uh, Buddhism, Islam. I mean, all the religions of the world are based upon a person earning their salvation, based upon personal merit, based upon hey, uh, you either deserve heaven or you don't deserve it. But the Christianity is nobody deserves it. But because God is gracious, he will give it to us as a free gift uh, by faith alone, 
in Christ alone. Uh, let me read verse 9 in the Amplified. Now, however, since you have come to know the true God through personal experience, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you are turning back again to the weak and worthless elemental principles of religions and philosophies to which you want to be enslaved all over again? I don't know, I, I can really picture Paul's frustration and even anger, his righteous indignation over the fact that he taught them correctly and then they believed the liars, the Judaizers, uh, the men from Judea, the men from Jerusalem, the men from James. These Judaizers, going into Galatia and all his other churches and continually being a thorn in Paul's flesh, a pain in the butt, uh, trying to ruin all of Paul's good works uh, and, and uh, telling people that Paul's a false apostle. And the truth is you can't be saved unless you're circumcised and convert to Judaism and follow all of Judaism. Uh, and only then, uh, is your believing in, G in Jesus uh, meaningful? Uh, so uh, Paul is just amazed that they, uh, when they heard the truth from him, that they were able to be persuaded. He says so quickly too. Uh, I think in, I'm amazed that you so soon, or I forgot exactly that phrase, but he's amazed that now, not, not only have you become apostate, but so quickly you became apostate. How is it even possible? You must have been bewitched. You've been, are you under a spell? Verse uh, 10. Ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm a, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul's saying, I, have I wasted all my time on you? All my efforts to teach you and uh, about salvation and guide you in your uh, uh, in your in your faith in your, your spiritual growth as a child of God, all that effort I put in, it's, was it really absolutely a waste of time and in vain? Was it meaningless? Because you're observing days and months and times and years. Let's look at that in the Amplified. For example, you observe particular days and months and seasons and years. Well, I think that's, that's be, be because that's a pagan ways. Pagan ways. Uh, these are things that are common with the uh, various pagan religions. And so he, he says, you're going back to these pagan ways and uh, you're, who knows what you are now. You're, you're trying to add in some Judaism and you've got some, some uh, Roman paganism. You're just a big mess. He says, I fear for you that perhaps I have labored to the point of exhaustion over you in vain. So verse 12, the KJV says, brethren, I beseech you. So when he calls them brethren, they are Gentiles. So the only way to take the word brethren in this case is he's speaking to them as saved people. Uh, so Paul believes they got saved, but they, they're apostate now. Uh, he says, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Well, that's a puzzle. Let me see that in the Amplified. Believers. So you see, uh, the uh, Amplified is translating that word brethren as believers. So I, I believe that is a correct way of uh, understanding that. Believers, I beg of you, become as I am, free from the bondage of Jewish ritualism and ordinances. For I have become as you are, a Gentile. Wow, okay, that makes great sense now. Oh, yeah. Become as I am, which means I am no, I don't, I'm not under bondage to Judaism anymore. So be like me. He says, I've become like you. Uh, I, I, I've become a, a Gentile. I no longer consider myself a Jew and I don't practice Judaism. Yes, he'll always be a Jew gene, uh, gene, genealogically, but in terms of practicing the religion, no. Uh, 
that was that's really beautiful because Paul is saying that uh, uh, um, become as I am a non practicing Jew uh, and I became like you a Gentile I eat Gentile food uh, I, 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 I associate with Gentiles see the Jewish people don't even associate with you because they think you're unclean so they segregate you uh, but no I associate with you uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm a Gentile in that respect um, so this is one of the best cases I think of, of where we see that Paul has actually denounced his Judaism um, verse 13 ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first so he was sick somehow let me see verse 13 the amplified on the contrary you know that it was because of a physical illness that I remained and preached the gospel to you the first time okay well I don't know if there's any other record of that this might be the only mention in the scriptures of that that uh, thing that I'm aware of so he's saying the reason I preached you first time is because I was stuck there being sick so while I was sick you benefited because I took time even in my sickness to tell you the good news so verse 14 and in KJV and my temptation which was in my flesh ye despise not nor rejected uh, but received me as an angel of God uh, now angel uh, really means messenger we should not take angel uh, to be a, some kind of a spirit being uh, that, that God sent down from heaven um, uh, the word evangelist uh, spell it out e-v-a-n-g-e-l i-s-t an evangelist is an angel which means a messenger, someone who has a message, and EV means a good message, someone who has a good message or good news, and IST means is you're the one that's doing it. So uh, if, uh, as an evangelist, I am a person who is delivering this good news, this good news message. So I'm not an angel in the respect that I'm some spirit being uh, that God sent down from heaven. Uh, so, but receive me as an angel. I think that that's the correct way of, of understanding Paul's identity as an angel. Uh, uh, let's look at this verse 14 in the Amplified. Uh, and even though my physical condition was a trial to you. So because he was sick, it put some kind of a burden on them, some kind of a strain uh, where they had to, you know, maybe they weren't sleeping. Maybe they were staying up all night nursing Paul, or maybe there was some kind of cost for medical supplies that they paid for. But in some ways, he says it was a trial for them. Some kind of a burden was on them because of him being sick. He says, you did not regard it with contempt. Uh, so when Paul was there, he was sick. It put some kind of a burden on them, but they didn't hold it against Paul. He says, you did not have scorn and reject me but you receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus himself. Okay. And now let's go to verse 15. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Wow. Wow. I mean, Paul is, was that impressed in how much they were, they loved Paul and they were devoted to Paul and that they would do anything for Paul, even pluck out their own eyes if necessary to, to help Paul. And, and now it's like, verse 16, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So the truth is that, look, you've left the faith. You, uh, you believe correctly, and so I call you brethren. 
Well, you're, you're, you are a believer in that you did believe and you got saved, and yet uh, you don't believe correctly anymore. So you're apostates. And how is it possible that this change can happen in you? And were you bewitched by the Judaizers? Did they cast some kind of a spell on you? How in the world did they do it and so quickly? I'm so flabbergasted about this happening and, and that you could so quickly be deceived like that. It was all my effort in, in uh, teaching you the gospel, was that just in vain? Was that like just meaningless at one in one ear and out the other? Uh, or at one point you even loved me so much you would have plucked out your eyes for me. And now I'm telling you the truth that you have gone astray. Now, does that make me your enemy? Uh, verse 16 in the 15 and 16 in the Amplified here. It says, uh, for uh, what then has become of that sense of blessing and the joy that you once had from your salvation and your relationship with Christ? For I testify of you that if possible, you would have torn out your own eyes and given them to me to replace mine. Let's see. There's a footnote there. B, let's see what that says. Uh, Galatians, Paul's thorn in the flesh possibly reflected his eyes in a visible way. Oh, okay. So this, this perhaps the sickness has to do with Paul's eyes. That's perhaps why he's saying you would have plucked out your eyes and given it to me. Perhaps because this sickness was was a problem with his eyes. Um, now, the Amplified's um, footnote here saying, Paul's thorn in the flesh possibly afflicted his eyes in a visible way. Uh, I don't buy that. Uh, I've taught on this before, and I'll say it again, that I believe if you go to the verse that refers to Paul's thorn in the flesh, and then you, you, you uh, think of the thorn in the flesh as being uh, a person or people who are antagonizing him, following him around wherever he goes and trying to spoil all of his work. And these people are a pain in the ass. They're trying to ruin everything I'm doing, establishing these churches, teaching people the real gospel. And so they are a pain in the ass. They are a thorn in my flesh. Now, if you, if you take that attitude towards the phrase, thorn in the flesh, and then you go backwards from where it appears, the, 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 the phrase, thorn in the flesh, go backwards a couple of chapters and read all of everything that leads up to it with that thought of mind, thinking that the thorn in the flesh are the false teachers who are, are trying to spoil Paul's work and uh, teach this, uh, you know, this, uh, this lordship, this, this religious uh, Judaism plus faith in Jesus uh, heresy. Uh, I think you'll probably agree with me that the thorn in the flesh is not some physical malady. It's not some kind of uh, 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 demonic at attacks that he's under. These are other theories about what the thorn in the flesh could be. So that's uh, verse, uh, finished with verse uh, 16. So I'll pick up with verse 17 uh, next time. Um, I guess in closing, what I want to emphasize is that uh, this is a series. If you happen to come across this video uh, singularly and, and you're, you're interested, uh, I hope you will go back and watch the series from the beginning. Uh, I have an introductory video to the book of Galatians, uh, and the introductory video is almost an hour long, but normally my introductory videos are just five minutes long. Uh, but I take almost an hour to lay down a foundation for this study. And that foundation is critically important for you to understand the Bible. If you don't understand what I'm telling you in the introductory video, if you don't already understand that, then I doubt very much you're going to understand much of what's happened in the book of Acts, Galatians, and uh, the book of James. You will not get it. So I hope you'll go back and watch this entire uh, playlist, this series. The Book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. Please watch it from the beginning. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.